Right. Um, well, welcome everyone. Um, uh, we're very fortunate to have Rob uh, able to, to give us his lecture today. Um, really, really grateful for you doing this, Rob. Um, I realise if, if we hadn't locked down, you would have been doing some research for the RSPB up in Scotland. Um, but um, So we have a silver lining uh, to this lockdown that we have you with us today. So thank you very much. I shall hand over now to Rob. Audio. Hope you can all see and hear me. Is that all good? All right. Thank you, Mr. Terry. Um, hope you can see and hear me, everyone. If you can't, then just put a thing in the uh, Q and A, and Mr. Down will be able to help you out with that as well. So my name is Rob, as Mr. Terry just said. Um, I left NKS about five years ago now. Um, I'm a zoologist, conservationist and science communicator. Um, if you want to get in contact afterwards, I put my email address and social media and stuff on the page as well. Um, so do get in touch if you want to. I want to talk to you today about zoology, uh, why I think it's the best degree in the world, uh, and what you can do right now to help wildlife in your gardens whilst we're in lockdown. Uh, if you've got any questions, pop them in the chat. Um, I'll try and answer them as we go. Um, or at the end, there's a bit of a delay on this presentation, so if I do Answer a bit delayed, that is why. So I want to talk to you about uh, studying zoology at university, some of the opportunities that presented to me, um, and then a little bit about what I've done since I'm leaving. So I left the university last summer and worked on a couple of projects in Wales and Scotland. And then finally, and most importantly, perhaps at the moment, um, things you can do for nature in lockdown. Some of the little garden projects you can go about doing and um, things to really engage with biology and zoology and all things wildlife conservation whilst we're all stuck at home. Uh, but before we get going any further, I've got three questions which we'll revisit at the end um, that I want to ask you to think about. You can write in the chat as well with the comments um, if you've got any answers for this. So first one, how many football pitch sized areas of rainforest do you think are lost every single minute? Second one, so how many tons of plastic um, enter the ocean every single minute. And number three, how many species get extinct every day? And we'll revisit that at the end and we'll think about how many trees, how much plastic, and how many species we've lost during this lecture as well, um, which might be a bit of a shock to the system as well. So I went to university in Southampton. For those who don't know where Southampton is, so you can see my pointer, it's down here on the south coast, about 100 miles away ish as the coast flies. Um, so I studied zoology, as I say, um, zoology, so what is zoology? It's the study of animals, uh, it literally means the study of animals. Uh, it's more broad than biology, so biology considers all of life, um, whereas zoology is considering the animal kingdom more specifically. It's a very broad subject area, it covers a lot of things, so evolution, genetics, uh, conservation, behaviour, um, all these different things are all very different parts of studying zoology. Whilst I was there, I specialised in behavioural ecology, which is the way animals are behaving in their environment and how um, they're responding to different changes in their environment as well. And also the use of acoustics, so using um, recording equipment to listen to some of these animals are more vocal um, to kind of see what we can glean from that. Whilst there, I got involved with quite a few societies as well. Um, this one here is the logo for the Conservation Society, so that's a lot of habitat management based work and um, all those sorts of things. Um, so there's lots of good things in Southampton and indeed every uni you can get involved with outside the, outside the study course as well. Um, so I just thought I'd take you through some of the research I did whilst at the uni, just to give you a few ideas of the sorts of things scientifically you can get involved with. Um, so my undergraduate research looked at European robin. So they, uh, people have suggested that by 2050, 80% of humans are going to be living in urban areas, uh, which is a huge problem because wildlife is going to have to adapt. These urban areas are going to be huge. Um, as a result, um, 
wildlife has to learn to live in these areas or move out of these areas. Some species like robins become very successful um, and can adapt to these urban environments. Uh, but why is that? So that's what I hope to look at with this study. Because we don't really know much about robins and we don't know much about the vocalizations. So you can see these two maps here. One on the left is of Southampton Common, which is a sort of very busy, loud urban park in the centre of Southampton. Um, and that was my kind of urban site. Um, and I was comparing it to this very rural site, very quiet, very, very different to this site, just to see how robins sung at each site and to see how they're responding to urbanisation. So this is kind of a simple, uh, simplified version of my setup. So I had this thing here in the tree, another picture of it here. So it's actually a taxidermy robin, which I borrowed from a museum. Um, and we tied it into a tree and hung some speakers underneath it and that played some robin song, um, which then played back, uh, was played back using this music player that I had about 10 metres away. That would attract in the robin whose territory it was. So robins are very territorial, but here someone singing in their territory, they'll come in, try and get rid of them. So that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to mimic uh, a live robin that's in a territory uh, that shouldn't be there. Um, so that was that. And then we had this microphone, so a dynamic microphone, so it's very directional and um, pointing straight at the robin. The idea being that whoever's territory it was would fly in and sit right by the other robin, try and get rid of it, sing straight down the microphone and I'd be able to record loads of song. And that's exactly what we did. So if you record Robin's song, then um, it uh, produces this sort of spectrogram, uh, which is a essentially frequency. So the pitch at which the robins are calling against time and it produces it visually. So all these blue bits you can see here are bits of Robin's song that we recorded. I'm hoping if I play this, you might be able to hear the robins. Maybe not. Uh, if you can't, then there's plenty of videos on YouTube as well, so you can look up what a robin song sounds like. But essentially, we have these sets of recordings from both sites, uh, looking at robin singing in an urban site, robin singing in a rural site, and we just compared the characteristics of both their songs to how they were singing differently. Essentially, did they have different accents um, as well? And what we found really was that the robins in the urban site were seeing a higher pitch and shorter, sharper phrases. So they're using a lot more energy to get their, their point across than the robins in the rural site. And we think this is because of the urban noise. So the, the, the cities are so loud and they have to compete with so much background noise and that they have to shout louder. So it's just like um, standing on a main road. If you're trying to have a conversation next to a motorway, you're going to have to talk louder and at a higher pitch to kind of help forward a conversation. And if you're in a very quiet room in your house, it's the same sort of thing with robins. And um, so that's what we were looking at with that. And then moving on from that, so in fourth year, um, I would continue the theme of looking at this sort of land use change. Rather than looking at urbanisation, I switched to look at um, habitat degradation and rainforest destruction. Um, I did that in Belize, which is a small country in Central America. You can see here, just next to Guatemala, just below Mexico. And I was very lucky enough to have uh, contacts to go and stay with out there. And um, so I went out there for three months or so to study deforestation. So deforestation I believe is a real problem like it is everywhere else. Um, you've probably heard of it in the Amazon, but it's just as much a problem in Central America, places like Belize as well. Um, so deforestation in, in Belize is continuing at a huge rate. Um, it's predicted that uh, they will lose all primary forests within 40 years. Um, and it's the highest rate of deforestation in the whole of Central America. Um, as such, the forest out there is getting really fragmented. And the number of forest fragments are sort of doubling uh, every year, and the forest becomes very, very fragmented. You end up with sites uh, like this one. Um, so this is my field study site. You get these little pockets of forest which are left in this kind of cleared landscape. Um, so you get very isolated pockets, the birds, bats. Uh, insects, everything gets stuck in these little fragments, um, but there's not really been much done into how that affects the, sort of the number of species and what species are able to live in these fragments compared to main forest. So that's what I was really looking at, comparing these fragments with the outside world to see what was what was using them essentially. So this is a sort of on the ground view of that site. 
Um, so the land in between has been turned into this sort of rough agricultural land, and then these little pockets of forest, which are kind of too hilly for them to farm, have been left, cuts it off quite considerably from the main forest at the bottom. So we're looking at that. The interesting part of this study, though, is that um, it's owned by a group called the Mennonites, um, which are uh, like, like the Amish population, very um, German Protestant population, very traditional, very conservative in their lifestyle. Um, they don't allow other people in very much. Um, so it's uh, studying things like this are as much about uh, learning to work around cultural and religious ideas uh, and to respect social um, sort of boundaries um, as well. So this, that was part of the project, was trying to make inroads with this community because it hadn't really been done before um, and try and see if we could work alongside them to, to study their landscape, which hadn't really ever been looked at. So again, another map of my field site, essentially what this shows you is that we had some dense forest sites down here that I compared to some or all of these fragments in the middle. How did I do the vocal stuff? So I had these little devices you can see in the corner, they're called audiomoths and they're very broad frequencies so I can record birds and bats on the same devices and you plug them into the computer, you turn them on and you tell them what times to start recording, what times to stop recording and you can go out and put hundreds of these in the field um, and they'll record loads of li little bits of vocal data for you. Um, and then you go through manually and you can listen for which species you're getting up here, compare it to which species you're getting down there. So it's a lot, lot involved in the analysis stage, but it's a really nice way of collecting a lot of data, particularly somewhere so inaccessible um, like Belize is as well. So I don't want to show you too many graphs and figures and things, I know you don't particularly want to see those. Um, this is just one that's quite interesting. So this is a few bird richness, so the number of different species um, in the main forest, so dense forest compared to inside the fragments, so inside that agricultural landscape. And you can see there's not much difference, so the number of species is consistent, but what this graph doesn't show is that the number of species did change, um, or the species that were there changed, um, to just the number of species didn't. So in the dense forest, you've got all these specialist species that are really well adapted to um, the landscape. And inside the fragment, you've got just very generalist species, sort of like the equivalent of your sparrows and your blackbirds here. And the ones that can sort of survive everywhere uh, were there, but the ones that couldn't survive everywhere were gone. And um, so although this graph shows there's not much difference in richness, the diversity index um, still changed quite considerably. And just another note on Belize, this is some of the cool things we saw we were there. And um, if you get an opportunity to get to the tropics, if you have been there, then you've seen some of these things, things like the keelbill, toucan, spectacled owl, and uh, absolute favourite of mine, insect wise as well, things like praying mantis, howler monkeys, all sorts of things. So going there really was a privilege and seeing some of these amazing things. So here that gives you just a little bit of an insight into studying a university, just some of the projects and things you can get up to. If you've got any more questions about university, I can cover those at the end as well. Um, uh, but that's just a bit of an insight of, of university life, I suppose. Um, in terms of university, I left last summer uh, and then two, one of the places I've worked since was on Skomer Island in Wales. And um, I was very lucky enough to go there um, for three months last summer. Um, it's a very small island, it's only about three kilometres squared. And I was living there with about six other staff members uh, in the middle of the island here. And this photo was taken just on this narrow bit, we call it the neck. Um, just over here as well, so you can kind of see the sort of landscape you've got on the island. Why should we care about this island? So Skomer Island is a really important place uh, for several reasons. Uh, for one thing, it's got 30,000 breeding pairs of puffins on the island, which is one of the largest in the UK, um, but that's not the species they're known for. They're known for this species. If anyone knows it, then I'm very impressed. It's the Manx Shear Otter. Um, it's an amazing little seabird. And um, Skoma has 750,000 breeding pairs of this bird um, and a load of non-breeding birds as well that go back every year. So we're talking about a million and a half birds on an area um, three kilometres squared. So that's a really quite incredible number of birds. Um, they've got this really broad wingspan and they can dive at depths of 30 metres, uh, which is incredible for a little bird. They're also burrowing birds. So Skoma is quite unique because it doesn't have any ground birds. So there's no rats, uh, no badgers, no foxes, nothing like that. So they can burrow in old rabbit burrows quite easily. Um, so they make their burrows in the ground. So one of my main jobs while I was out there was to help weigh the chicks every day. And um, not obviously not all of them because there were millions of them, but we had these small study plots and we would put our hands down the burrows, pull the chicks out, weigh the chicks um, every day. 
and see how their size differs each day, just to get an idea of um, how they're growing each day. So this is chick here was born last beginning, uh, middle of last July, it's just, just as I got there. And um, this is the same chick about two months later. So it's got a lot of its adult plumage, it's a lot, lot bigger and um, beaks a lot sharper and a lot more painful as well. Um, but that was one of the main jobs was, was looking at these Manchu orchards and seeing how they develop um, with an aim to kind of conserving them in the future. And they're amazing little birds. That guy left about two days after this photo was taken and they fly without any knowledge of where they're going. They fly to Argentina uh, where they spend the winter. And it's about 10,000 mile trip and we do it in about a fortnight and um, having just come into the world. So, um, yeah, I could talk about this bird for hours, but I won't bore you anymore with it, but um, it's a very, very cool bird. Another species we were looking at while I was out there was the grey seal. So the grey seal colony out there is a really nice um, species. And then it's about 250 breeding grey seals every year. And they get they produce pups between about August and October. Um, so my own, other main job while I was out there uh, was we had to abseil down the cliffs and to look in the caves and look on the beaches to see what seal pups we had down there. So this guy was only a day old when we found him and um, very, very, very small. When they get to about five days old, we spray them with uh, just like standard cheap sprays sort of things you see on with lambs in the fields. Um, and that, each one gets a unique colour combination. So this is green, yellow. Um, so when we look from above, we can then identify which pups which. So from looking from the cliffs, you see a green, yellow, you know that's that pup. It doesn't harm them at all. It's just a way of monitoring them to kind of see who survives. Um, so if you see a, a, lot, a lot of pups will uh, wash up dead, unfortunately. And it's just the way thing that happens with grey seals. But if we know what colour combination it was, then we know um, who was likely to um, have killed it and also uh, why it's like why, why it might have died. So it's just a really extensive monitoring program underway uh, for grey seals. So that's just something else that's been on the island. So that's SCOMA. Uh, after SCOMA, I moved to Scotland uh, about six weeks later. And that's where I've been on and off ever since. Um, up at RSPB Forsenard, uh, which is about a 20 minute drive from the north coast. So I'm talking north, north, north Scotland. Um, started, it's why it's, it's why is this reserve so unique? Um, so it's actually built on blanket bog. It's the biggest area of blanket bog in Europe. So what is blanket bog? So blanket bog started forming about 6,000 years ago. So you've got your bedrock at the bottom um, and then you get uh, a lot of rainfall on this surface, it doesn't ever really dry out. So that encourages lots of species like bog mosses and uh, grasses and things like that to grow because they're the only things that can grow on, on this sort of landscape. Um, means when they die, they're also covered in water. Because they're covered in water, they can't really break down. And it's very, very acidic as well. Um, so rather than breaking down like plants normally would, um, they just form this sort of peaty layer. Um, and it forms peat and then another layer of peat another layer of peat, and peat is just very sort of concentrated, um, very moist soil essentially, um, with lots of plant matter in it as well. So uh, in areas here, so this is the lookout tower from the field centre, so um, if you measure the peat here, it's about seven or eight metres deep, and the deep you go, every metre is about a thousand years, so there's about seven thousand years of peat um, built up here. Why should we care about this? So peat is really, really important. Um, they, Peatland only covers 3% of the world, um, but actually contains 30% of the world's carbon. So if you burnt down every tree in the whole of the UK, um, it would release uh, half as much carbon dioxide as if you released all the carbon from just this one site in North Scotland. So they're really amazing reserves uh, for storing carbon. I'm sure you know a lot about carbon dioxide and, and the harmful things it's doing in the atmosphere. So if you were to destroy this habitat, it was really, really bad for releasing carbon dioxide. Unfortunately, they have started destroying this landscape, um, which is perhaps unsurprising to you. Um, in the 1980s, the government introduced uh, tax breaks. So essentially, um, landowners in the area would get money off if they planted trees. And um, why they thought this was a good idea in Scotland, they had no idea. Um, but as a result, landowners planted lots of conifers. Conifers aren't supposed to be built in the bog because, of course, these are very wet landscape normally, but they grew them anyway. As a result, it completely dried out the bog. You can see here there's no water and um, nothing can grow. It kills all the native mosses and it disturbs all the peatland. So the peatland starts breaking down and releasing all that carbon, which is obviously really, really bad. 
so what are we doing about that? So that's what my main job is while I'm up there. Um, so you can see two of the wardens here. We're putting in peak dams um, to try and raise the water table um, and restore it to what it was. So when they put the trees in, they put these furrows in um, to kind of to plant the trees in. It completely destroys the bog. So they're going through ripping out these furrows, returning it to a nice flat bog um, to try and restore the people and get these species going by putting in these peat dams um, with these the big, big pile driver uh, mallets that we use. And um, you can kind of try and rebuild the water table um, and therefore uh, rehydrate the landscape and um, bring it back a lot of the species that should be there. Um, so it's just a huge restorative um, undertaking, particularly up there. Um, the whole reserve, if you push it down the country, would stretch from Glasgow to Edinburgh. Um, so it's a really, really big reserve um, and it's really, really important work that they do. And I've been there since um, November, October, November. Um, time, um, but unfortunately, due to COVID, uh, I'm now back in Kent for the time being. Um, but I hope to be back there up soon. So moving on, so that's just giving you sort of some things. Research at the uni, hopefully that made some sort of sense to you. I know I went through it quite a little stop tour, um, and then hopefully you get an idea of some of the things you can do both in Wales and Scotland. Just a few projects I've been able to do. Um, Obviously, the most pressing issue really at the moment is uh, lockdown. So we're all stuck at home, as you well know. Um, obviously, it's a really terrible crisis. Ecologically speaking, it's been a good time uh, for it to happen, if there's ever a good time for it to happen, as it's spring. Um, there's a lot to look at out your window. Um, if this was happening in winter, it'd be a very different story. But as such, being spring, there's a lot we can do for nature and a lot of nature we can watch. So things like the signets, so I've been watching these signets in the lake over the road. Um, they were born about two um, two or three weeks ago. Um, so there's lots of chicks around, um, things like foxgloves. So this is a plant that only comes out in June. Really beautiful flowers and they're very toxic. And this is a marsh frog. Um, so lots of amphibians are spawning uh, at this time of year. So there's still a lot going on um, and there's a lot for us to kind of help and, and to watch as well. It's really good physical mental health. Uh, to watch wildlife and also to get involved in actively conserving it. So I just want to give you a few sort of ideas of things you could think about doing for wildlife, either sort of more DIY um, sort of things or doing some sort of more writing and research type things and a few ideas for that as well. So one of the simplest projects you can do if you've got a garden uh, is to leave a wild area and that's as simple as choosing an area of lawn that you don't mow. Um, make not sound like much, but give it a few weeks, that will grow quite high. This is only a couple of weeks we've had our bit going in the back garden and we've already got some sort of wildflowers coming here that weren't there before. And um, it's great for the insects, it's great for birds um, that eat seeds, things like starlings will come in for, for seeds and ants that are all, all amongst this grass. Also provides a lot of cover for things like hedgehogs and other sort of, um, smaller mammals, shrews and things like that as well. So it's a very, very simple idea. Um, but a really, really nice one. You should see a lot of interesting stuff. So just leave a bit of lawn, if you can, um, to allow wildlife to sort of take over. Because you think how many lawns there are in the UK. And um, it's very, very under, um, biodiverse. There's not much you can use them. Um, so just by converting this bit of lawn, it really does make quite a huge difference. Another one, hedgehogs. So hedgehogs, I'm sure, are a favourite of yours. They're definitely a favourite of mine. Unfortunately, there have been a huge decline. So since 2000, we've lost uh, what people think up to 50% of UK hedgehog population. Back in 1950, um, there were about 35 million hedgehogs in the UK. Now we've got barely a million, and so it's dropping all the time. And we've got a real risk of them coming extinct in the UK, which would be really, really sad. Why is this? So hedgehogs are largely uh, threatened by agriculture, so lots of um, agricultural intensification, so if you've done about that in geography or biology, so um, fields are becoming bigger, they're removing the hedgerows just to kind of increase this monoculture idea, making um, fields uh, less diverse, uh, less areas for nature around the edges, and also in parks and gardens as well, things are becoming much more fenced in, hedgehogs cannot get through um, to, to get to, a, to find mates and to breed and to find food. So usually hedgehogs, if they were undisturbed, would be able to travel five kilometres a night. Um, and they're only active for about four hours right in the middle of the night. And they can travel five kilometres, which is quite a long way. 
But with all these fences and uh, lack of hedgerows, they just cannot get around. One really simple thing you can do for this um, is to cut a hole in the fence for gate. Obviously, ask permission and ask for help when you're doing this. Don't just cut holes in your fences. Um, but it's a really nice, simple way. So they need about 12, 13 uh, centimetres squared um, to get through. So, and then they should be able to squeeze in. So this is just in the garden gate and um, allows the hedgehog to get underneath the gate, and come into the garden and leave again. Really simple idea. But if everyone had a hole like that in their fence, we wouldn't have this problem with all these gardens becoming really fenced in. Um, so it's really something to consider. Just to prove to you that it does um, work, I put the coal in our garden fence. And then here's some footage we got. So this is the ver very first night I put fence in. We haven't seen one in the garden for years. Um, and this guy decided to show up just on the very first night he'd gone in. Um, so there's some footage of it using the hole. You can just about see it disappearing under the gate there in slow motion. And that wasn't it. So over the next few weeks, loads of footage of the same one um, coming in and out. And um, you see that there. So this is a Friday and a Wednesday. We know it's the same one because I can see that notch in the, the back of the spines there. And um, so same hedgehog coming in and out. And then more footage later on. I think that's possibly a different one, a slightly different size. So just by making a simple hole in the fence, we've got a hedgehog coming in and out of the garden, which is a really nice thing to watch at the moment and really good for them as well. So that's hedgehogs. And then another thing is, of course, birds. So keep just keeping a list of birds and taking photos of any birds in your garden is a really good thing to do. Um, birds, especially at the moment, have got lots of chicks. So blue ticks have got up to 10 chicks in their nest. So they need a lot of food to feed them on. So getting hold of some bird seed is a really nice idea. Um, you can get that online. Bird feeders are obviously a bit harder to get hold of, um, especially at the moment. Um, but a really nice thing you can do is just turn old water bottles into some bird feeders. So all you need to do is put some wooden stakes um, through your water bottles, add some holes a few centimetres above, um, about five millimetres. And you don't have much bigger than that because all the seed will pour out. It's so about five millimetres works quite well. And then just fill it with seed and hang it. And it will take them a few days to get used to it, but you'll soon get loads of birds on there and um, things like blackbirds and sparrows and robins and all sorts of garden birds as well. And um, so do put one of those out. Um, another thing to do is to put out a bird bath. Um, so all this is is four bricks in a circle um, and then an old dustbin lid upside down. Um, you fill it with gravel and um, just for a base layer and then put things like stones and rocks and twigs and things so that things can get in and out and fill it with water. And you get all sorts coming in, so this should work with the video. There we go. Um, so within a couple of days, I had this nice big fat wood pigeon in the bird bath, and they love to come into bird baths. It gives them a drink, uh, allows them to cool off, and it, they can also use it as a bit of a, there we go. Um, they can use it as a bit of a bird bath as well. So they flick all the water in between all their feathers to remove all the sort of parasites and dirt and dust and things that are building up. Some sparrows coming in there for a drink. And as soon as the wood pigeon had left, the wood pigeons came in, sorry, the sparrows came in properly. So there's plenty of sparrows on there as well. Um, and we've had things like starlings taking drinks from it as well. So really effective. We're not talking about buying anything here. We're just anything you've got in your garden. It doesn't have to be a dustbin lid, it could be a plant pot base, and it could be anything like that. And um, so definitely think about going out and putting one of those out. It'd be a really nice little thing to do. It's another final sort of project for you to think about. Um, this is garden ponds that I made quite recently. Um, so the number of garden ponds are thought to have declined by 70% um, since 1950. Uh, they used to be hugely popular and now they're not so much. Obviously there's issues with uh, for, for dogs and small children, but one way of getting around that is to put in a mini pond in your garden. So this is just a washing up bowl um, which was uh, lying around and I sunk it into the ground. And um, you've got a layer of gravel at the bottom, put these stones all around, make sure things can get down this sort of nice sloping sides as well. And then the important thing, point is if you are making a pond, don't fill it with tap water because there's a lot of chemicals in tap water and um, that the uh, the things that like to live in it don't like. So things like frogs wouldn't spawn if it's in water that's really like chlorinated. So you want to fill it with um, rainwater if you can, or if you have to use tap water, then leave the sand outside for a while, it evaporates off all the chemicals. And um, so fill it with that sort of thing as well. And this should be really good for a lot of things. So birds have been coming here to drink. 
And um, we've also got things like uh, amphibians as well that like to spawn in the water. And then, of course, you've got all your you know, pump creatures, all the bugs and uh, mini beasts as well. And they just started to come in. So it does take a bit of time. You may think there's nothing using it at first, but over time, this is going to blossom quite nicely. And when I can get to the garden centre to get some pond plants, I will be adding those as well. And um, pond plants are a great thing to, to add. So all these things are great, obviously, if you've got a garden. And um, if you haven't got a garden, then you might be looking for things more home based to sort of think about and to, to carry out from your house. Um, so the next few slides are just a few things you can do uh, inside from your home and um, that don't involve having a garden. So the really great first one really is Zooniverse. It's a website you might have heard of. Um, harnessing the power of the crowd, learn how you can crowdsource your research. So essentially Zooniverse is a website that allows researchers from around the world and um, from universities to put data that needs analysing online, huge databases, um, and any member of the public from anywhere in the world can then go in and help them do that research. Um, it's a really nice scheme, so they encourage people from the age of five can do it, some of them are more complicated than others, but you always get a little tutorial before you start doing some data analysis um, on there. And it really is proper scientific research, they use all the data, it's just the way of getting all the data analysed. So I went on there yesterday just to see what the current ones are. There's hundreds and hundreds on them, but one of the ones they're recommending at the moment is this one. So this is camera track footage of uh, New Zealand, and all they want you to do is to look at these images as they flash up, and do you see any skinks in the, in the clip? So a skink is a, um, a lizard-like reptile which you get in New, particularly in New Zealand. Um, so you just have to look through the images, and then it'll give you loads of images before you start, and it kind of shows you what a skink is, how to identify it, that sort of thing, and then you just click on yes, no, images too blurry, or I can't tell, um, and then you just go through. And it's a really, really nice thing to do, and it's a really good way of getting involved in real active research, particularly at the moment, if you can't get outside and then just see some cool places in the world from all seven continents, there's there's data that needs analyzing. So get on there and see what you can find. Um, it's a really free resource. And um, yeah, can't recommend the universe enough. Another thing to do is consider writing. Um, so writing is about nature. It's just a really good thing to do. It's very relaxing and it's a way of really learning what you're seeing. So while I was at uni, we were encouraged to keep field notebooks for all the field research we did. So this is a field notebook I kept from the New Forest. Uh, we did a lot of work in the New Forest in the second year at uni, um, and we were encouraged to sort of really draw what we see. So drawing here, um, the buds on things like cherry and beech, and they don't have to be good drawings, as you can see. They're just kind of little illustrations just to kind of think about what you're seeing. Um, so why not do that now? Why not keep a field notebook of what you're seeing, what you're hearing, and um, draw the wildlife? and um, look it up, think about it. Um, and yeah, it's a really good way of, of keeping track of the wildlife as well. If you go on Twitter, there'll be, there's loads of things, people that want things written at the moment, um, blogs and online blogs and things, I'm sure you've seen a lot of those on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that sort of stuff. Um, so do go and find those as well, they're really good things to write for. I'm an editor for Bloom and Doom magazine, um, which is a magazine that's looking at um, nature-based solutions and reporting people's experiences of nature and all that sort of thing. And we're always looking for contributors. So if anyone wants to think about writing for Blue and Doom, um, feel free to message me, but I can definitely include that at some point um, in one of the online issues. Um, so if, if writing really is your thing, then get in touch with me. And um, if you want to write something, because I'd love to have some contributions, particularly from um, people from lots of different backgrounds, so that'd be great. Um, so writing really is a, a really good thing to do. So there's just a bit of a roundup for you um, of all these all these sorts of things uh, you can do at the moment. So 30 Days Wild is the thing you might have heard of um, and it's going on at the moment. It's run by the Wildlife Trust and it's a scheme that to get people engaged with nature every day of June. So we're on day, what is it today, 10th of June. So this is day 10. It's going to run till the end of June. And the idea is people do something or think about something to do with nature every single day of June. Um, Obviously, we're only 10 days in, but I'm challenge my challenge to you really is to get out there and try and do something in nature for the next 20 days of June. So if we miss the first 10, doesn't mean we can't do the next 20. So I've given you some of these garden projects. And then there's also and also research-based projects as universe, do some universe every day, do some writing, do some drawing, and um, do some reading about nature and um, see what you can find. Um, and yeah, 20 days to go. So let's see how many days we can all do between us in that time. 
So I'm just going to end by going through these questions. So I asked you these at the beginning. How many football pitch sized areas of rainforest are lost every minute? So this is all these figures are sort of disputed, but these are the most up to date ones I could find. Um, answer to the first one is unfortunately 60 football sized pitch areas, 60 football pitch sized areas of rainforest lost every minute. So one a second is lost. So during this talk, what are we about 30 minutes? That's well over 1500 football pitch sized areas of rainforest lost as we're talking, um, which did a bit of maths this morning. I think it's about 310 uh, NKS fields, so uh, including the AstroTurf and everything out there, um, 310 of the school field have been lost during this talk, um, particularly in the Amazon, um, which I think is just quite a terrifying concept. How many tons of plastic enter the ocean every single minute? So we're looking at 15 tons every minute. So we've accumulated about 375 to 400 tons of plastic whilst we've been doing this talk have gone into the ocean. Um, I don't know what that equates to weight wise, but 375 tons sounds like quite a lot to me. How many species go extinct every day? So 200 is the current figure that's, that's banded around. That's quite disputed. Uh, it could be less than that, it could be more than that. But 200 is what we're thinking at the moment. Um, so that's about three species that have gone extinct during this presentation, which um, I think is also quite a terrifying concept. Um, so I just wanted to show you these, not to show you doom and gloom, um, but just to show you how much more we've got to go with environmental um, studies and all this research and all these things we can do at the moment really do contribute. And I hope these terrifying statistics just show you that um, the fight is still there and there's a lot to do for nature. And hopefully it's just something to get you energised, particularly at the moment while we've all got the time at home to think about lockdown, um, during lockdown to think about wildlife. Um, and to really, really, really appreciate it as well. Yeah, nature needs us. That's kind of my, that's my point of this. And I hope that what I've been able to show you today um, gives you a flavour of some of the things you can study at university um, as part of your zoology degree. Um, and then also some of the places you can work once you've finished. And um, so things like SCOMA in Scotland, just to give you an overview um, of where my zoology career has taken me. Obviously, there's many different pathways. This isn't by any means conclusive or everything you can do with a zoology degree, but um, just to give you some idea. And then finally, sort of thinking about what we can do for nature right now. And um, so giving you some of these garden based projects, writing projects um, and um, research based things to think about as well. That's all I've really got to say. And um, thank you for those of you that put in questions. I'll get through those in just a second. If you do think of any others after the talk, then my email address is there. And then I've also got my Facebook and Instagram channels where I'm doing lots of science communication at the moment. That's where I'm putting out all my videos and, uh, and photos that you've seen throughout the presentation. Um, so I'd really appreciate it if you check those out. And if you want to mention me on there, that's also fine. Uh, and my Twitter as well. So thank you for that. Um, if you've got any more questions, and keep them coming through. Otherwise, I've seen a, a stream of questions here, so I'll just go down them one by one and answer them. Um, if you think of anything else, then do you answer that? Uh, right, so I'll start at the top, work my way down. Uh, I think we've got 13 at the moment, but as I say, keep them coming. So Harry asks, what GCSE subject did I take and what A-levels did I take? So GCSEs, I did... Um, Although it's embarrassing, uh, geography, history, and art. That would be that would be the one, um, and along with all the, the regular ones. At A level, I did maths to AS, but I didn't even do ASs anymore. Can you? And um, so I did biology, chemistry, and history to A two. And yeah, uh, do they hunt fish? And what else do they eat? Uh, I think we're talking about the man shear waters. Yeah, so they're diving into the water um, up to 30 metres. Um, they'll eat fish, they'll eat sort of things like um, crustaceans and any little bits and bobs in the ocean as well. Unfortunately, they eat a lot of plastic as well, um, not intentionally, but because it looks like fish. Um, and they're getting at such speeds to get down to about 30 metres depth in the water that they'll often pick up a lot of plastic as well. Um, can you study in a different country for zoology? So, yeah, there are plenty of ones. So um, if you're talking in the UK, then there's plenty in Wales and Scotland. But if you're talking around the world, um, there's also a lot of courses, particularly in, in Europe as well. Um, 
they're more specialized. So I know in France, they don't do straight zoology. You have to do biological sciences. Um, it's the same as sort of chemistry and uh, physics and things, like, I believe, but they don't do very specialist subjects. They do more generalized. And you can do biology or you can do chemistry or you can do physics. Whereas in the UK, there's all, obviously so many of these courses. But I know in America, you can do zoology um, and it's, and in the UK as well. Uh, what hunts the seal pups? Um, so the biggest threat to the seal pups is actually the male seals, um, the bull seals. So bull seals are massive. And if you're down, when we were down on the beach with the bull seals, we definitely keep our distance because um, they're, they're huge. They're sort of, we always used to say they were sort of the size of a sofa, um, and they really, really are when you're down there. Um, so, but they'll go for the seal pups. So they just want to mate with the females constantly, um, basically. So they will attack a female and her uh, pups that she's had with another male um, and, and try and kill them um, because then he can mate with, with the female. So the biggest threat them really is, is other males and other mums will get quite savage as well sometimes if they come too close. So, um, and also bigger goals and things. It's quite a hard life for the seals. And the biggest threat to them really is the weather. So um, a lot of them get killed by uh, being thrown against the rocks and, and drowning and all that sort of stuff. So it's not a nice world for a seal pup. Um, Cameron asks, uh, what different sections of zoology can you take? So zoology is quite broad. Um, so uh, I, I took this more behavioural acoustic sort of pathway um, with my Robin and, and Belize research, but there's loads of other stuff out there um, to study as well. Um, evolution and development, physiology, animal physiology all comes under that um, category as well. Uh, anatomy, all those bits and bobs. What predicts am I doing in the next few years? So I'm going back to Scotland for as soon as I can, uh, hopefully in August. Um, for a few months um, and then there's a few things sort of in the pipeline I'm hoping to join a it's my, my long-term aim is to get into wildlife broadcasting and science communication um, and then my long-term aim is to study a master's in um, wildlife film production and um, so that's kind of where I'm headed there's a film company that are taking interns on that so that's um, kind of my next goal and my next aspiration is to, is to get, a, a get onto one of those um, and then essentially I've managed just to travel around and see lots of different places and um, I'd like to go back to Central America as soon as I can because it's an amazing study out there, the sort of diversity of, sort of stuff you can get out there. Uh, you and us, where can you find the most seals? So there's a lot of seals on the west coast and um, around where I was just going, you get a lot of grey seals. You also get a lot of Atlantic seals as well up in the north and um, more so Scotland. Um, so Scotland and Wales are really good places, or Norfolk as well. Unfortunately, we don't get many in Kent. Um, you do get them off Dungeness um, in South East, um, very, very far South East um, of Sussex, but um, around Kent, you're not likely to see too many, unfortunately. Rough are uh, so, is it an algae? Uh, sorry, I'm not too sure what you're talking, what, which bit you're talking about there. Uh, let's see if I can scroll back through. And, and um, this is after the serial stuff, isn't it? So I think we're talking about force and I think it was um, sorry. Potentially. Uh, sorry, I'm not too sure what you're talking about there. Um, how long will it take to restore the peat? Good question, because particularly in this picture you can see. Um, all these bits of trees, still bits that need to come down up on that hill. There's thousands or probably millions of trees there now. So this is very much a long term challenge, um, but it's about slowing down the problem, really. So restoring bits of uh, peatland back. So this was this area here was forested. Um, th th this was never forested. Sorry, this was always left, um, thankfully, to, to pristine peat. But these bits over here have just been restored. This hill here was cut down just before I arrived. Um, so that bit's um, been uh, recently cut down, so they're in the process of restoring that bit. So it really is done in sort of like compartments. Um, so it's a very rolling process. It's not going to be an easy fix. Um, incidentally, they only put these um, tax breaks in to allow them to plant trees for about seven or eight years. And yeah, this is going to take several hundred years to undo the damage. So 
there's a, there's a, a thought there and kind of thinking about things properly before you implement them as well. Um, is it tricky to start to study zoology and you remove that if you take it? Um, yeah, I guess it, it is tricky. Um, definitely bits of it that I enjoyed more than others. I find the physiology side of zoology quite difficult. Um, so that was that was more difficult for me, but it's so broad you can really specialise in what your interest is. I, I got really interested in the conservation and the behavioural side of things. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of specialisation you can do that. Do you want to become a vet afterwards? Then definitely, that's definitely a part where you can consider. I was going to do veterinary originally while I was at school. That was always what I wanted to do. And it was only at the last minute that I kind of um, changed my mind and uh, went went down the zoology route. Um, but you can definitely do veterinary afterwards. There's issues with funding. So if you do a zoology group first, um, you can't get second funding for a second degree. That's the only problem. That's the big snag. Um, so you have to be able to fund it yourself. But in theory, it is possible. How, um, how much money can you make from being a zoologist? Well, unfortunately, not much because it doesn't pay well to be a conservationist, unfortunately. Um, it depends what you do. So some organisations pay better than others. Um, the RSPB pays quite well, um, although I wasn't being paid while I was there. I should point out that was an internship. Um, so I'm not on to a paid position with them just yet. Um, if you work your way further up ladder, then it's quite well paid, but um, unfortunately not too much, but it's, it's like any of these things, it's, um, you, you do it as well for the, for the satisfaction. If, you, if you're in zoology for the money, you're in it for the wrong reasons. Um, so um, yeah. What happens if rats start coming through the gap? Um, gap in the fence, presumably. Um, that shouldn't be much of a problem because rats are so um, probably not too comforting, but rats aren't are quite good at getting over fences anyway, so they wouldn't rely on a big hole like that. They could squeeze under this little hole that's already there. Um, so that wouldn't be too much of an issue. Um, Harry asked what camera traps did I use? Um, so these ones, that's a good point actually, I meant to talk about that. This one, this camera trap is just a um, Aikman camera trap. You can get them on Amazon for about, oh, I think I bought it for £40. They're really not very expensive. And you record records infrared and daylight and it records sound and colour and all that sort of stuff. So these really aren't expensive bits of kit. Um, they're comparatively cheap. Um, so that's another thing you can do at the moment is um, get yourself a couple of days and see what's in your garden at night and when you're not around. Um, I'm sure you see some interesting stuff. But yeah, so um, pretty cheap bits of kits. Hold on. I've heard about these rubbish islands, which is the biggest. Um, yeah, see, which one is there? there's There's an island of floating rubbish off Texas, I think is the biggest one. Um, and it's called um, Plastic Island, I think they call it. Um, and it's essentially one of these once enough plastic is accumulated in the ocean um, you get all this plastic sort of pulled in um, and it's sort of got its own um, I, I don't understand the physics of it but it pulls all the plastic in um, and it sort of holds it all set up together and I think that's the size of Wales that one um, floating off Texas um, which is horrifying to think about um, in too much detail but yeah so there are huge amounts of plastic in the oceans uh, for sure uh, why did you study zoology at Southampton? Um, do you mean why did why Southampton specifically? Um, so I chose Southampton really because of the the broadness of the course, and I really liked that you could kind of specialise so behavioural stuff and acoustic stuff, and also um, there's a lot of field work involved. So I went abroad every year for my field work. Um, the first year I went away to Spain, and that was paid for by the uni. That we went all the whole course went to Spain um, for two weeks. Um, and I was lucky enough to go back in the second year to help out um, with the field work. Third year I went on a field trip to Belize, and then in the uh, summer of third year, so just after that, uh, for my fourth year of work, I went to Belize again. So I really liked that as well about Southampton. Um, and I should point out when I went to Belize. Um, my lecturer's parents had uh, own a, a lodge, an ecotourism lodge out there. So that's why I was looking to go out there for that long. It would have, I wouldn't have been able to afford going out there for that long, but um, they were able to help me out with that as well. So 
Finley asked what my favourite animal is. That's uh, a very hard one. And that, you ask me that every day, that would that would change. Um, I would have to say, hmm. okay, I'm going to say a tree creeper at the moment, which is a type of bird, um, which I've been trying to see a lot at the moment, but I haven't seen one uh, since I've been home. And they're a tiny little bird which clings to the side of trees. If any of you watching spring watch them, they're featuring a, a tree creeper nest on there. Um, I'd have to say. I'd have to say then, but possibly the Manx Shields and possibly the Seals as well, but that's only because I've worked with them, so I'm biased. Do I agree with the ethics of zoos? So zoos are a really tricky one, um, and it's probably too much to go into in too much detail here. Um, I think when zoos are done right, um, they can be really good. They were set up with quite good intentions, so the Dur Durrell Zoo on Jersey was set up with really good intentions to really help endangered species. Um, and they're, and while I was in Belize, I went to Belize Zoo, so I've got one zoo out there, and they'll only take in animals that have been injured and 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 um, nurse them back to health and then release them. So it's a very different sort of idea of zoos out there. They, they'll only take in animals as long as they need to be taken in. But zoos are also a great resource, so all these species that none of us have ever seen, I've never seen a tiger or any of those sorts of things. So zoos definitely have their benefits, but um, they have to be in the right way. I think there's as much satisfaction personally from going to places like Skoma and seeing seals and puffins and things like that in the wild as you do get from seeing wild animals um, in a zoo. Um, but um, that's definitely a good debate. If anyone's got any thoughts on that, that would be interesting. Um, what were your favourite aspects of the course at Union? Would you recommend? I can't see what the end of your question is there. Uh, would you? Fair aspects of the course, so you're going to Spain, going to Belize is definitely part of them. And um, all the skill work, skill work is my love, really. I, I love being outside working, and um, so that suited me really well um, as well. Which project is my favourite to do? I can't really say it's got one because I haven't been there long enough, and um, I was supposed to be there till September, so this is all kind of but spanning the works a bit. So I'm going to have to say Skoma so far, um, just because. We had a lot of visitors. We had 250 day visitors every day, six days a week. One day a week, we wouldn't get any visitors. And then we just had the island just to discover, um, which was really, really nice. So we kind of feel very privileged then to be on an island. So six of you on an island with just the puffins and all these seabirds and all these seals. It was very, very lucky. So I think just for, the, for, that, for that feeling, uh, I'd have to say Skoma. Um, rolling on a four year master's and undergrad and master's later on. Okay, I see. Um, so I did a four-year master's just because of funding. Um, so essentially, you do the undergrad and the master's tags on the end. So I haven't actually got a BSc in zoology. You do an MSc, which includes the undergrad as part of the course. And um, so at the end of four years, you just get an MSc. So it's still it's exactly the same as having a separate master's. But the advantage of being you can do it through student finance and get funding for it because it's an undergrad level degree. Until you graduate in fourth year, you're still an undergrad, even though the fourth year stuff is master's level. Um, it still counts as undergraduate funding. So for me, just for funding wise, it seemed like a better option. Standard masters are good, but I, I'm probably biased, but I don't think you get much more out of doing a separate masters, unless you're looking more specialised, unless you want to move in new place to do it, then you don't lose too much um, from doing from doing to go to masters. So um, yeah. I was, I would say do an integrated, but um, yeah, I was trying to see that last question here. Uh, I can't see the first word. Um, are there any animals that I would like to see in the wild? So um, part of these expeditions that I'm looking at joining are to Antarctica, and um, purely because Antarctic wildlife is something that I've always dreamed of seeing, um, and it's definitely a next step for me um, in terms of what I'd like to see. Um, so going down to the south uh, and start to, to different penguins, that's the that's the real dream. And that's what zoology allows you to do, the same possibilities. If you've got an aspiration, you've got species in mind, you can probably do it. Um, so I think that's for me why, why zoology is the best degree in the world. Um, but obviously I'm biased. Um, I think that's all the questions coming through. If there's any new ones, um, are there any animals in the natural habitat? Yeah, I just covered that one. So, 
any more questions, do pop them in the chat. I'll stay on for we can stay on for another couple, couple of minutes just to see if anyone else has anything else because I think it's the day. But um, other than that, thank you for listening to me prattling on. Um, I hope you found something, some of that interesting. And I hope it's shown you some of the things you can do at uni um, once you've left uni and also while in lockdown as well. And let me know, send me pictures on uh, email um, of any projects you do, uh, any of these, if you need any help with the universe or if um, you want to write some stuff for the magazine do get in touch. I really like to hear from you. So um, yeah, thank you for listening to me. Um, if you're still still here, and thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's me. Just about done. Let's wait a few more minutes to see if any questions come in. Well, I just want to say thank you ever so much, Rob. That was really great. Actually, really interesting. It's such a you got through so much information actually in quite a short time. Um, I'm sure there'll be more questions. Oh, we've got a question coming through. Hang on, I'll just check. Oh no, it's a it's a thank you from Harry Palmer. Okay, thank you, Harry. Thanks, Sarah. I'd like to say thank you to Mr. Gowan as well for helping me uh, organise this and and, um, and make sure it all went smoothly. So thanks, thanks for everyone. Actually, it's fantastic.